Is it Brianna? Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah, I can now. Sorry, oh. I was just checking my records to make sure I was right about what you missed. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm still trying to catch up on everything. Gotcha. Um, but I was planning on trying to take it before the end of this week. Okay, uh, you want me to set it up in the testing center, or you think you can get a hold of a mirror to do it at home? Uh I mean, yeah, I have a mirror. I can do it. At, well, yeah, I have a mirror. I can do it at home. Let me show you a photo of. Uh... Oh, man. <laughs> it wouldn't let me send it to you. I'll send it to you by email or text message. I have a photo of, of a good way to set up the mirror. Uh, a couple of students have been doing it, so I'm trying to do that. Uh, I'll send you that and. That way you can go ahead and do that. You also have an online test four that you hadn't finished yet. So knock that out oh if you don't Lord. mind. When was that due? That was due uh the the day you got back from spring break. It was supposed to be done by then. Well, I thought I I didn't take that. Nah, you might have took the practice test and thought you were taking uh -oh. it. Yeah, so it was, oh wait a second. No, you did take it. Yeah, you did take it. I, I was reading I was reading crooked. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, For some that... reason, it has it on there twice. Like, yeah. if you look at the top of the list, it says zero, and then you keep going to the bottom, and then it shows like that. Yeah. yeah, it's, I don't exactly know how to get rid of all these old ones. I thought if I just unpublished them, they'd go away, but they're still showing up. So, yeah, it's a, it's magic. It's what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll send you a, a message by text message of the actual, uh, photo and and that's sort of the best way to set it up if you can do that that'd be great okay i had a couple students took it and i had to actually now they got to retake it because basically i couldn't see anything about what their hands were doing and uh the one thing i did see their hands doing was mess with their phone they might have just been logging in for that initial part but if the phone's out anytime during a test i'm supposed to give them a zero for cheating so it made it complicated so we'll work something out Ooh. okay I might actually be able to do it here. Let's see. Yeah. 
Yep, this is the one. Okay, yeah, I got it. Cool. I'm sending it to your text message right now. Uh, sorry about the photo. I whited out their face just because I try to be somewhat anonymous. <laughs> I got you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah, got up. Oh, I was going to say we got about a minute before class starts, and it looks like the time is now. Anybody have any questions before we get uh, started? No questiones. Like my mastery of the Spanglish, the, the Spanglish, <laughs> the Spanglish language. I, I got your email. I mean your text. Gotcha. And, and then I send it. I sent one back to you. I haven't been able to check it. My problem is my they're doing work somewhere in the neighborhood and on the on my on these um damn stoplights and putting all kinds of new shit like every single night at certain points the internet's going out. It's been happening for like four days. And then I, they had the Cox van in my neighborhood today. I was getting off work when um, I got your text. And then I had to pick up my son. I'm in Taekwondo. But I just drove by the house. And there I got Cox fans out there again today. Um, so I don't know. They have to reboot a couple of times a night. And anyway, that was it about that. All right. That's cool. All right. Uh, I got three more people coming in. Good deal. Okay. Let's see. Thank you. Uh, Actually, I know. Gotcha. I see it now, Kara. Sorry. I'll I will uh, send. I'll reply to you uh, in that in a little bit. Uh, just be no know that nothing happened. Your 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 grade's fine. Uh, let me go ahead and make a blanket announcement. This is actually the uh, something that everyone has sort of been asking about. So yesterday and the day before, I went into Canvas and started cleaning up uh, the grade book, which I for. <laughs> This is like the fourth time I thought I did something already and it didn't go through. So I don't know if my internet connection is like dropping me and then I hit save thinking I did something that didn't do it. But anyways, this is another instance. So uh, all of your grades might have changed. I would not be surprised by a large amount like your grade could go from like a, you know, a 90 to a 60. <laughs> OK, now what happened was uh, in some cases there were missing assignments. And in other cases, uh, those missing, in some of those cases, the missing assignments were counted as non-zeros. Uh, in other cases, they were actually counted as zeros. That's something I got to fix before the end of the semester. I try to do okay. it early yeah. enough to make sure that uh, you guys know ahead of time. Another thing is it automatically drops the lowest test grade and a couple of your lowest homeworks. I don't do that until the very end of the semester. So I reset that. So a lot of quote unquote bad grades, grades that are going to be dropped, got thrown back in. So that could have made your grade change quite a bit. And then, of course, you had a uh, an actual midterm where the class didn't do that great on average. They they didn't do horrible, but they didn't do that great on average. So that also brought uh, some people's scores down. So I just want to let you know, that's pretty much what's going on with it. Uh, I did not see anybody. Well, I saw exactly one person that I really thought was having a problem and I dropped them last night. So uh, uh, basically I had to drop them because they missed so much stuff, but I, I don't see anybody right now that looks like they're in trouble of failing. Now, if you just don't want to make anything less than an A, then yeah, you might want to might want to have considered to drop or something like that. But I, everybody still has the ability to make an A at this point, so that's what I'll give you as a blanket statement for that. Anybody have any questions on anything else? I just reset all the due dates. For some reason, I was thinking our last day of class was five five, but it seems it's four twenty nine. So it's actually a lot of bit earlier than I thought. So I went ahead and put the deadline on all the extra homework assignments to be on the 28th uh, at midnight. So hopefully that'll uh, allow you guys to do any extra credit you might want. Uh, those extra credits, of course, replace any zeros you might have. That's the main purpose of doing them. So just, you know, if you uh, do them, just let uh, just know that that's how the points are going to be distributed. The main thing is focus on your test grades. Uh, do the homeworks as best you can and, and use them as a learning experience. Uh, to be honest with you, the best thing you can really do, though, to uh, do well in physics is 
solve a buttload of problems. So the more problems you solve, the better off you'll be. And uh, you might have to, for a little while, look up things and see how they do them. Uh, that's sort of what the examples in the book are supposed to do. But if you lean too much on looking at that, it will actually sort of make it harder for you to succeed in physics. Uh, so just check that out. But anyways, we're going to go ahead and get started on chapter. Oh, I had yes, one question ahead. before I turn off the mic. Okay, so you said the last time I asked that we've had the first test and then the first face-to-face -face midterm, that there's a third face-to-face -face and then a final. There's actually two more face-to-face -face tests. Two more face-to-face. -face, yep, and then a final. Point. Yeah, and the finals face to face as well. So two more face to face in a final, or one or one more face to face in a final. Two more in a final. Two more. Yeah, let me double check just to make sure uh, that's what I'm remembering. But I have it uh, a schedule drawn here, so I can check it out just to remind myself. So yeah, it looks like a total of four face to face and a final. Oh, oh no, no, nope, nope. I see. I had an old schedule where they had four. No, they have three. So you have one more face to face. That's supposed to be between April 2nd and April 8th. So whatever your lab day is between April 2nd and April 8th, that'll be our test three. And then uh, the last week of class, what I do is if you guys meet lab on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, or if your lab meets on Tuesday, then uh, I might do it the Tuesday before that. Uh, okay. But that's all to, for Maria. Yes. I, I do have to ask you about that. Why I brought it up again is my son's spring break is the first week in April and I won't be there at the lab class. So I'll either have to schedule it at a testing center. Uh, if it, or I don't know about that week or take it at home or find something else, something I can do because my yeah. dad's not available to take care of him. He's under radiation therapy right now. Yeah, it's not not a problem. Uh, like I said, we can do the testing That's center, all. or if you got a big mirror, uh, I can allow you to take it online. Uh, I have a I now have an anonymous good mirror placement photo that I can show students, so they'll know exactly how to place it. Uh, if I let them use that, if you have a mirror like that, you can use, then there won't be any problem with you taking it at home. Yeah, I've got I've got mirrors at home. <laughs> Only thing is, I have my kid running around, but <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I've got two weeks till then. Okay. All right. So right, we're going to jump into chapter 25. Uh, chapter 25 is called Electric Current and Resistance. And it starts off talking about uh, the electric battery. And the electric battery was a, a monumental step forward technologically. And it was done by uh, Luigi Galvani, who you might know from his exploits with his brother Mario. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad I got one giggle out of that. But anyways, uh, Luigi Galvani uh, basically was working with dead frogs and saw that uh, sometimes the dead frogs would twitch, which is a bit unnerving, I'm sure. And, and you can do this with, with human dead limbs, if you wish. Uh, I, I don't suggest you collect dead human limbs, though. That would be problematic, at least. So don't do that. But anyways, uh, you... <laughs> He can do this. And one of the things that people thought was maybe that was the quote unquote life force, you know, the soul, that sort of thing. And uh, scientists were somewhat skeptical, but at the same time, they, you know, they definitely did their crossing of their T's and their dotting of the I's. So they, what they really figured out it was, was really anytime you put two dissimilar metals, two metals that were not the same material uh, next to a muscle that it would actually cause them to twitch. That's now known as a galvanic process. For instance, I have uh, a lot of galvanic processes going on in my mouth because uh, as a young kid, I was sort of like uh, the Homer Simpson school of, of dentistry where, you know, if it's getting late at night or whatever, and I'm worried it's time to go to bed, uh, do I grab my toothbrush and make sure I brush my teeth? No. I usually would drink a soda and swirl it around in my mouth and it felt really clean thereafter. And, and that was literally the advice that Homer gave uh, Bart one night. <laughs> he actually gave it to Bart and Lisa told him, well, at least swish a soda around in your mouth before you go to bed. So needless to say, I had a lot of cavities and stuff like that. So now if I actually stick metal in my mouth, I feel like voltage shoot through my head, through my jaws and stuff like that. So you can feel that a little bit, especially if you have fillings. If you don't have fillings, I'm curious if you get it at all. Uh, aluminum foil, like 
gum wrappers, you know, chewing gum wrappers. They come in that little aluminum foil sheath thing. I put one of those in my mouth and man, I feel it. And now I got a, a actual implanted tooth right here. And that's actually got a screw that runs way up to here. And boy, that sucker, if I get metal near that, I can feel it's like, like a magnet pulling it towards it. And then when it hits, it feels like it completes a circuit or something. So that's a galvanic process. You might also notice it if you ride around any kind of, uh, boat shops or uh marinas or stuff like that like the one on centerville for instance if you look at a lot of the boats you'll see that they often have just like a random slab of metal stuck to the back of the boat that's also to uh to deal with galvanic processes because of course if you're in a uh perfectly uh what's the word for it uh a perfectly distilled water then this isn't an issue but if it's not perfectly distilled water then it tends to have ions floating around in it so even fresh quote-unquote fresh water uh would do this but the main thing is you've got a lower unit of an engine usually or at least a prop and a prop shaft those are normally stainless steel or steel for the prop shaft stainless steel for the prop uh actually some of the prop shafts are actually stainless steel well and some of the lower units of engines are usually aluminum uh those dissimilar metals tend to make one uh metal the donor of material and the other metal the acceptor of material uh and it's about their electronegativity so if you have something like that uh or if you just look at a boat that has been left over in the water for years or been used for years you'll often find little holes not necessarily microscopic uh, actual full-size holes in your lower unit or in your propeller or something like that that comes from that uh it's basically the same process as, as plating so when you gold plate jewelry or something like that it's the same mechanical and chemical process going on there so one of which is basically one of the metals in the case of gold plating it would be the gold metal is a donor and the atoms of the gold fall off the gold and land on the atoms of the necklace or bracelet or whatever same thing happens with a boat uh, atoms from one of the metals lands on one of the other metals and they often will put like i said a random chunk of metal in there that's more likely to give off the particles than the quality stuff that you don't want to get pitted and to get holes in it so you can actually hang those little slabs on there so that's another case for the galvanic process so ultimately it was just determined that uh basically electron affinity is what's causing that uh in the early days of Michael Faraday and even before that with Cavendish and those people, uh, they did take some time to figure out what the electronegativity of certain things were. So you could make this electronegativity chart. And from that, once you had it, you could tell, hey, if I take these two particular things, let's say rabbit fur and amber, and if you rub rabbit fur against amber, uh, you could tell from where the names appear in the list, you could tell which one's going to accept electrons and which one's going to steal electrons. And that's sort of what's going on with this again, but we're sticking to metals in this case. So all of that uh, still applies. It's just, it's, you know, sort of a forgotten science. Once they worked it out, we don't really think too much about it uh, unless we work in that field, but we can, so we, we can actually figure that out. And what uh, Galani was able to do was basically he was able to make a battery. And before this, we basically just had the ability to work with electricity in terms of static electricity. So we would, like I said, rub fur on a, on a piece of amber and uh, that fur would cause one of the two objects to be negatively charged and the other one to be positively charged. And then you could put all those charges on something called a Leyden jar, uh, which is more or less like a mechanical capacitor that was made like out of a glass jar or something like that uh but when you went to study voltage or anything like that you build up all that charge on your laden jar and then you let it go and boom you get all the current coming out at one uh fail swoop and you didn't really have the ability to see a progression in time so it limited a lot of the learning that we were getting but when galvani comes around and makes a, an actual battery then we could actually not only uh 
control how fast the current comes out and stuff like that. We could even uh, make it delay and look at it and study it a little bit better. So that was a really big undertaking. Now, all he really has to do, I'll, I'll explain the way that I've done it uh, several times myself. Uh, so I'm giving you nitty gritty stuff that uh, you don't necessarily get in the books, but you could take like a prescription bottle, little, you know, those little orange prescription bottles. Uh, you could take, for instance, a zinc washer, and maybe you could try to solder a piece of wire to that zinc washer, and then you have that wire run from out from uh, from the actual prescription bottle. It's actually attached to the zinc that'll be in the bottom of the prescription bottle. That wire will run off here and then go up the side of the prescription bottle. Of course, housed, you know, it's only going to have the end exposed where it's touching the zinc. And then it'll have the, the housing on the wire from there on out. And you just pull it out of the uh, prescription bottle. Then what I do is I put like vinegar or water and vinegar or lemon juice or just about anything will do. The main thing is uh, you can even do just like salty water. That works pretty well. But again, you've got that liquid in there that is not distilled water. That's the one thing you don't want to put is distilled water. Uh, you also don't want to drink distilled water, by the way, because that actually can cause you to die. Uh, uh, Whereas drinking plenty of ionized water is, is certainly helpful, you know, water that actually has ions in it, excuse me, that's helpful and keeps you from dehydrating. But if you drink too much uh, uh, distilled water, it's the pH is off and you're, you're basically uh, making your blood dilute and you can literally cause your heart to stop because it needs certain ions in there at a certain rate or you're not your muscles aren't going to work so just keep that in mind but anyway as long as you use anything other than distilled water just about any liquid uh like water in the prescription bottle will be fine so we've got the the zinc washer down at the bottom and then what i, I do is i usually put a piece of gauze there just to keep the two from touching I, it's just something i came up with on my uh yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, uh, distilled water is pH neutral. Deionized would also be as bad, but I've always been told the distilled water was bad enough. That being said, I, I've never tried it, but uh, I do I do know that a acquaintance in uh, Elizabeth City area died by drinking too much distilled water. So uh, I was answering a question on here. But anyways, now that we've uh, got that uh, zinc washer down there, I said I usually put a piece of gauze on there, but that's just something I always grew up with. I don't know if that's even necessary. I don't see any diagrams saying that is necessary, but I put a piece of gauze and it just sort of makes sure there's some fluid between the two uh, between the two washers. Next, I put a, a piece of aluminum on top of the gauze that's on top of the zinc. So I have zinc gauze aluminum now at that point i could take a wire and connect it to that aluminum maybe even solder it to the aluminum and when i actually connect one side and i don't know off the top of my head which one would be positive which one would be negative uh that's that electronegativity stuff i was telling you about but when i do that i could take one end and connect it to the v omega sign on our multimeter and the other one connect it to the com the COM, the black port on our multimeter and make sure I put it on DC voltage. And it reads somewhere between 0.3 and 0.7 volts for just those two washers sitting in that liquid. And it's just because one metal is aluminum and the other metal is uh, zinc. And zinc's that bluish, silvery looking shiny metal you see at Home Depot and Lowe's. It's actually a really crappy metal. It says it's for for outdoor use but it's really crappy for outdoor use it's not going to last long if you use it uh really if you want outdoor use if you don't care about it being soft brass is is the best thing uh if you do care about it being soft then you want to use like stainless steel or galvanized now again with just those two pieces you can get somewhere between 0.3 and 0.7 i think 0.7 is a, a norm uh, but then you could put another piece of gauze on top of that, remove the wire, put another piece of gauze on top of that, put another zinc, another gauze, another aluminum. And now the neat thing is if it was 0.5 before, if I measure it now across four of them, then now it's going to be like one volt. It's almost, you know, it almost doubles when you double the number of uh, plates. Now, the other thing is as you get more and more plates, it starts to slow down like tripling the number of plates is not going to triple the voltage once you get a certain number it starts to slowly increase as opposed to hugely increase but other than that it, it does build up so you can keep doing that and doing that and doing that 
and so you get whatever voltage you want it's just not exactly like you expect like if you got point uh let's say you got point six with two uh pieces of metal one one aluminum and one zinc if that was what you got point six then if you put two pieces of zinc and two pieces of aluminum you almost certainly will get 1.2 if you put three pieces of zinc and three pieces of aluminum, again, staggered like they're supposed to be, you're almost certainly going to get 3.6, uh, or excuse me, 1.8, uh, so on and so forth. But once you start getting up to four, five, six pairs, it starts to diminish how much you get out of it. So you're not going to be doubling it or anything like that. So other than that, it just keeps on going and you can build up voltage eventually you'll get so high a voltage that the air will actually become ionized close enough to it that it sort of flattens it out. So you, you do have some kind of maximum, but that is what we use as a battery. Uh, in fact, we normally use what's called, anybody know the A word that we use regarding batteries? It's a, it, the word starts with A, pretty long word, and it says battery. Anybody recall what that word is? Alkaline? Yeah, there you go. Alkaline battery. And that generally means it's made with a base. Remember, alkalines and acids. So the, the base would be the solution. Uh, like, well, I was talking about putting vinegar in it and stuff like that and lemon juice. That's an acidic battery, and, and that works fine. Uh, and you'll see the diagram in your book has sulfuric acid, which is what's used often in car batteries. Uh, so, you know, it is okay to use acid, but there's also a, a case to be made for alkaline batteries. I don't really know all the technology and ins and outs of, of why alkaline became so popular and, and what exactly lithium does that makes a lithium battery so much more different than some of the others. So I don't know, that's not my field of expertise, but it is an interesting thing. I, that's probably one area that Elon Musk might know quite a bit about uh, that and, uh, you know, how to build networks for PayPal, that kind of thing. But anyways, uh, that's how you could build a battery. Uh, that's also how you could metal plate stuff. So if you wanted to cover something with gold, you could, you know, make sure you have the right metal to go with gold. And then the gold will actually fall off the gold bar and uh, land on the other thing that could be just steel or whatever. So ultimately what the battery was called was a pile, P-I-L-E, -E, because it looked literally like a pile of metal like this and you keep stacking them up stacking them up stacking them up and you get more and more voltage the higher you go uh additionally you can also do it not uh not necessarily with a prescription bottle in other words you could actually use like a potato i don't know if you've seen big bang theory but there's a frequent uh claim made on big bang theory where uh a guy played by bob newhart who's professor proton um makes a potato clock and of course, Penny asks, well, is it, a, is it a trick potato or is it a trick clock? And he's like, neither. And she said, well, then you saw, the, has it solved the world's energy problem? He said, no, no, not at all. But anyways, that is a real thing. You can use a potato, you can use a tomato, you can, I've used a banana, I've used a lemon, I've used an apple. Uh, I suspect you can use just about anything. But when I do this for kids, I'll take my lemons or whatever I bring and I give them to the kids and then I go into like Home Depot and buy like a number one uh, copper wire, like maybe that long, like a six inch long piece. And I buy a bunch of them so we can string them all together. And then I buy uh, several galvanized uh, 16 penny nails or even uh, larger nails if you want, but 16 penny works pretty good. The reason being is the galvanized is covered with some material very different from copper. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think it's got some zinc and stuff like that in it. Uh, but anyways, the main thing is you take the lemon, say, and you jab the copper wire in one end and you jab the uh, galvanized nail in the other. Now you take another lemon prepared the exact same way and you connect the wire from the galvanized nail to the copper wire of that lemon. And then you do it again with another lemon and another lemon and another lemon. And each one of those gave me about 0.2 volts. Each lemon did. Uh it turns out you need, in, in most cases, for like to turn on an LED, you need about 0.6 volts. So if you put like three lemons in a row, you could actually light up an LED. If you're wanting to light an actual incandescent light bulb, even that little guy like we used in our lab, uh, that takes quite a few lemons. I'll just warn you that way. But it does work. It, you know, it will ultimately work. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that, uh, that the professor professed on Gilligan's Island was somewhat right. Okay.
Any questions on that and how, how we go about making an electric battery? All right, so that was the main part of this was the, uh, this first part was just getting over discussing of the battery. Uh, now what I want to do is I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. It looks like I got the right day, okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is start writing up my notes. Today is the 19th. I got to make sure I put my date right. I thought I'd already done this, but I remember I, I stopped. So now I've gotten all that. Okay, so we got to talk about next the parts of an electronic circuit or electric circuit. Specifically by parts, I mean the things that we study in it. And we've already talked about, for instance, voltage. But now we can talk about uh, current as well. All right, so I duplicated that. I'm over here. So what I want to do is go ahead and share my screen. And I think I'm going to do it first with, with this screen from the book, just to give you uh, one of the pictures here. OK, so you can see here is a picture of a little space heater. Uh, inside the cab of a really cool snow vehicle of some sort that I think is really cool. I love the idea of being out in some kind of serious snow in mountains like that without out, you know, succumbing to the ele elements. But like I said, having never lived in a seriously snowy area, that's uh, probably a little bit of romanticizing on my behalf. But anyways, what I wanted to show you was this was the contents. We're going through electric battery. I just talked about that ad nauseum. We're doing electric current, Ohm's law, resistivity, electric power. Power and household circuits, alternating current, microscopic view of electric currents. These last two sections, uh, I don't even think they ask any questions in the homeworks on them, but I'm definitely not going to ask you any questions on the any tests. So don't worry about that, but they're good. They're worthwhile to read. What I wanted to show you is look at these pieces of wire that you're seeing here. Look at A, which is this one right here, and B, which is this one right here. Let's assume both of these pieces of wire are made of the same material. Maybe it's copper. It doesn't matter just as long as they're the same material. Uh, which one do you think would have the largest resistance, A or B? And you can type your message in the ch uh, your answer in the chat if you'd like. I did open up the chat. So, do you think A or B would have the largest resistance, meaning the largest resistance to flow? A, a lot of people tend to think B, but I think they're sort of thinking of it. Uh, maybe they're thinking slightly of conductivity as opposed to resistivity. What I'm trying to say is what makes it harder to get current through there. So what I normally tell people is, and there's a good reason, it's not just me trying to pick on old people or anything like that, but I generally say, uh, imagine trying to get a bunch of elderly people out of a home. And when you think of that, then you can uh, use an, an analogy as a piece of wire uh, representing like a hallway to get old people out. So you see A and B. A represents a really short hallway that's very short and narrow, whereas B represents a taller highway, uh, hallway that's uh, wider and taller. The reason why I say old people specifically because sometimes they have, you know, things that have to go with them uh, in their wheelchairs that have some height on it and that sort of thing. So it makes you think more than just the width, but also the height. So the fact that you can fit in some sense more people through this little section B in a single minute, say, than you could through the section A. And of course, you'd have to scale it up to make it to be the size of people, because if it's the size of a wire, that's not very big. Uh, that tells you that B has the least resistance and A has the highest resistance. So what that tells us is that the resistance seems to be inversely related to the area, right? The area meaning uh, like how much paint would it take to cover the left end or the right end of A or B? I think you all agree that the left end of, of B would take more paint than the left end of A. Do you all agree with that? 
Okay, so that's the area that we're talking about, an area perpendicular to the direction the current would go. So that when I say R is inversely related to, R, the resistance is inversely related to the area, that's what we call a thumbs up, thumbs down. And what that means is if the area goes up, the resistance goes down, okay? Alternatively, if the area go, or if the area goes down, the resistance goes up. So we would normally treat that as R, and then we'd put that little proportional fish-looking symbol, and then we'd put 1 over A. So that's a typical result that we're going through. But before we do that, I want to now consider uh, B, since we already decided B would be the least resistant. Uh, would B be le least resistant, or would D, as in dog, be least resistant here? So uh, you can ask it, answer it either way. As long as you tell me which way you're answering it, that's fine. So uh, which one would be more resistive, B or D? Or which one would be less resistive, B or D? Anyone? Notice they're supposed to look about the same height and width, meaning uh, width perpendicular to the screen and height uh, parallel to the screen, what's different about them is their length, L. You can use the old person analogy as well, though, so that still helps. Anyone want to put up an answer? All right, well, not a big deal. Uh, so... In addition to, you know, trying to get elderly people through a, a hallway, obviously the taller ha hallway and the wider hallway allows more people per unit time, and that's a good thing. But what if the hallway is, say, uh, 16 feet long versus 100 feet long? If you think about it that way, you know, using rather extreme versions – then I think you realize it clearly is going to take more time to get elderly people out of a hundred foot long uh, hallway than a, you know, a 16 foot long highway. So current uh, going through the resistor D would actually have to go a farther distance and therefore it has a higher resistance. So we will say that R and L, the length are thumbs up, thumbs up. What that means, <laughs> what that means is if the length goes up, so does the resistance. So all of that was just me trying to argue uh, heuristically exactly why we have the formula for resistance that I'm getting ready to show you. So I'm going to share my screen from my iPad now, and I can put together what we just uh, learned from uh, thinking about trying to get elderly people out of a, a retirement or nursing home. Uh, through a hallway. So with that, hopefully this will come up and we'll be able to show it to you. Oh, there it is. Finally. Okay. So what we discovered was that this quantity resistance, by the way, we know resistance from our lab already. And when I put that bracket around it, remember I'm asking you, hey, what are the units? Can anybody tell me what the units are for resistance? Anyone? Yes, very good. Uh, Brandon says ohms. And ohms is exactly right. And this is the capital ohm or the capital omega, as in I am the alpha and the omega. That's the unit for it. Now that we have that, what I'm going to say is R is proportional to L. That was how we decided that D was, in fact, more resistant than B as in boy, and it was inversely proportional to the area of the wire. So that's how we report that. And then you probably know from high school algebra one that to go from a proportional to an actual equation, we add an equal sign and a constant. So what we do is we know there's one more parameter that's relevant here. And, and basically I said it when I first started looking at those bits of wire, I said, assume those two pieces of wire are made of the same material. So if we want to take into account the material, we need to put another parameter in there 
for material. And then, of course, we could put a constant too. But what we've done is just assume that's going to be the constant. And we say that the object with the higher resistivity has the higher resistance. So uh, that means it's directly proportional. And the symbol for resistivity is the Greek letter rho. And then I've got rho L over A. And that is the actual formula for resistance of a length of wire L whose cross-sectional area is A and whose uh, material has a resistivity rho. Any questions on that? Now, you guys know enough about lengths and areas uh, and resistance. So can you tell me what the uh, units of the resistivity is? You can look at that equation. You should be able to figure it out. That's definitely a skill you want to, to make sure you leave physics with if you don't already have it. Uh, close. So you're thinking right there, Brandon. Uh, what you know is the left-hand side has to be ohms. That's what the capital R has to be in, right? You know the length has to be in meters. You know the area would probably need to be in meters squared. So I got a meter over a meter squared. That's just going to leave a single meter in the bottom. But I need that row, when it's multiplied by all that junk, that row should produce an omega, and that's it. So I, it needs to have an omega followed by a meter so that it can produce the omega that you want and cancel out the extra meter in the bottom. So that's the units uh, for resistivity. So that's the unit, that's the object resistivity. Your book in fact has some very specific tables of resistivity. And we'll go even further and say uh, that the resistivity and the resistance both have a temperature characteristic, meaning if you actually increase the temperature, you actually make the resistance higher. Because you can imagine what's going on when the temperature increases, the molecules or atoms making up the wire vibrate and move much more rapidly and again if you've got a hallway packed full of you know young kids dancing and playing uh with games and stuff like that in a hallway and you're trying to uh get the elderly people out of the the nursing home then obviously the kids bouncing around really fast and being a pain in the butt in the hallway is a lot worse than when they're just sitting perfectly still or sedate so that's literally what's going on with the atoms and molecules in the wire is as the temperature gets higher and higher, they move more rapidly and therefore are more likely to, to hinder the progress of the charged particles moving through it. So uh, with that in mind, the equation looks just like the equation we learned before about how the length of a rod is compared to its length at a different temperature. Uh, you'll remember how I derived that and how it came up to the special form. I'm going to show you that now. We have the res uh, resistivity at temperature T is equal to, to the resistivity at temperature T0 times parentheses 1 plus alpha times T minus T0. So notice this looks just like the L equals L0 times 1 plus alpha uh, parenthesis T minus T zero that we did in chapter, it was either 17 or 18. I can't remember. Uh, this is the temperature coefficient. Of resistivity. And some people will say the temperature coefficient of resistance as well. And that's acceptable. And the reason it's acceptable is because look at this other version of the equation. The resistance at temperature T 
is equal to the resistance at temperature T0 times parentheses 1 plus alpha T minus T0 again. So that is another equation that's helpful for us. So if you want to calculate the resistance, you can use this equation. But if you just want to know how the resistivity changes, you can use the other equation. Now, I want you all to look inside the square brackets. Notice that that alpha is multiplying by a difference in temperature. And then that term, the alpha times the parentheses T minus T0, that term is being added to a pure number one. So hopefully that allows you guys to figure out exactly what units alpha has. So you think anybody here could tell me what the unit of alpha is? It is the same one that we used in chapter 17 or 18 whenever we did that one, by the way. <laughs> Anyone? Uh, yes, an ohm... An ohm is its is a derived unit. Uh, you can get it from V equals I R. So V is joules per coulomb, and I is coulombs per second. So an ohm is a joule per coulomb divided by a coulomb per second. So that would be a joule second per coulomb. That's a that's what O that's what an ohm is. Uh, someone asked that question in the. Uh, chat. So I'm going to go ahead and answer this question for you. Remember, the alpha has to be multiplied by a difference in temperature. Uh, and then that product has to be added to a pure number one. So that means when it multiplies by that difference in temperature, it should leave no units. So that tells us the cell, uh, the alpha has a Celsius degree. Notice I put the degree after. And that should be raised to the negative one power. So that's the unit of alpha. Just so you'll know. Of course, we should always do this just as, as students of science and engineering. Whenever you have an equation like that, you should immediately start thinking, what are the units of each of the symbols? And that's something you want to do over and over. Now, for the record, your book does give you a table. It also gives you a, a diagram of a uh, specifically a Volta's voltaic cell or voltaic battery. And you can see that it's labeled with A's and Z's. So it says A, Z, A, Z, A, Z. And that A is aluminum, that Z is zinc. So you see that. But the other thing I was talking about is when you actually go solving problems, you will need uh, terms like the resistivity, the resistance, and all that good stuff. So it's good to have an actual uh, table with that information in it. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up real quick and just write down a couple so you have some idea of what the magnitude is. So I jumped to the section 25.4, which is where resistivity is. So there's the section 25-4, resistivity. So in that case, for instance, at least among conductors, uh, you're going to have a resistivity rho measured in ohm meters, and you're going to have an alpha measured in Celsius degrees to the negative one power. So we can write it like that. Uh, I will tell you uh, a few specific ones. So for instance, silver and gold are a couple nice things. So it turns out silver has a resistivity of 1.59 times 10 to the negative 8. Gold has 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8. And if I go a little further to more normal stuff, I can say copper, which you assume is a lot of what wires are. But to be honest with you, copper is kind of expensive. Aluminum's uh, a little more frequently used. Uh, actually, I copied the copper wrong. I misread it. Uh, it's 1.68 is the copper, not the gold. So I, I copied the gold wrong. I think I said I copied the copper wrong, but what I meant was the gold. So it's not 1.68 for gold. In fact, for gold, it's 2.21. Whoa, Nelly. 
So you can see gold has a higher resistivity than copper or silver. Silver is actually quite a nice metal, but for obvious reasons, we don't use that for wiring of our houses. I want to go ahead and do aluminum because aluminum's considerably cheaper than copper. Uh, and right now uh, you're looking at 2.65 times 10 to the negative eight. Your table, uh, table 25.1 actually has uh, not only conductors like these, it has uh, semiconductors. So just for the record, carbon, and this is carbon in graphite form like a powder okay that graphite of carbon has a resistivity anywhere between three and 60 but notice it's times 10 to the negative fifth instead of 10 to the negative eight so it's quite a bit less resistant than silver or copper or any of those things so they call it a semiconductor germanium silicons are other ones so on and so forth actually silicon's kind of weird Silicon actually has 0 0.1 to 60, not 60 times 10 to the negative fifth, just 60. And then they have, of course, insulators as well. So for instance, glass. Glass has 10 to the ninth to 10 to the 12th ohm meters for the resistivity and hard rubber. which you can pretty much imagine is basically like what, what your tire would have on your car. Of course, your tire's got metal running through it, so that's a little bit different. But if you just took the rubber part, it would be about 10 to the 13th all the way up to 10 to the 15th. Okay, now what about the alphas? I'm just going to put a few of these. So, for instance, for silver, the alpha is 0 0.0061. For gold, it is 0 0.0034. For copper, it is uh, 0 0.0068. Whoa. And aluminum is 0 0.00429. Okay. Uh, again, I just was trying to give you some examples of what it is. This is really more than I normally give, but I just wanted to give you, this is coming from table, uh, as I said, table 25.1 of Gene Coley's book. So anyways, that's some values. And of course, the, one of the main reasons we give you that is some of the problems they're going to ask you uh, to do calculations, you know, determine the resistance of a piece of wire. They'll give you the length. They'll give you the diameter uh, and they'll tell you what the material it is. And uh, they'll ask you for the resistance of that. That means you're going to have to use rho L over A. Uh, they'll also ask you how the temperature is going to change that resistance. So that would require you to use either RT equals RT zero times parenthesis one plus alpha parenthesis T minus T zero close parenthesis or the other formula. So that's partly what that's for. So what I'm trying to do right now with this chapter is I'm just trying to give you some of the equations that we're going to be using, uh, make some sense of how they're going to be using them, that sort of thing. And then next time I'm going to do a lot more of the examples going straight forward. Uh, now, now that I've covered resistance in general and specifically resistivity, which is a property of, of the material. So keep that in mind. Uh, this resistivity, like the coefficient of uh, temperature coefficient of resistivity, these are properties of the material. And what that means is, for instance, if you were a chemist and someone gave you a chunk of stuff and wanted you to identify what that stuff was, one of the things you could do is fashion it into a shape of a wire, calculate the resistance, uh, knowing the length and the diameter, 
And then you could use that to eliminate a lot of things. And then all the ones that you come close to would be candidate materials. Uh, if you then tried to figure out the alpha, if you got the alpha and the uh, row, then you're pretty confident that you actually have the right material. Probably would make sure that you didn't know of any other ones that had similar row and alpha values. Uh, but you could also use, for instance, just simple density, which is another property of material. That usually would change it up. So anyways, those are properties of material. And for that reason, you can actually use them to uh, identify substances. So it's just another thing we can use to identify stuff. Uh, you'll learn that that's a really big deal. For instance, one of the things that we uh, have made us so powerful in astronomy and astrophysics is the ability to recognize light given off by matter. So it turns out matter actually interacts with light in such a way that a light, a particle of light called a photon can be absorbed by an atom, but it can only be absorbed by that atom or even that molecule if the energy associated with that photon, which is either given by Planck's constant times the frequency or Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength, that's the way you calculate energy. If that energy happens to match the energy difference between one electron's orbit and another orbit for the electron, then that photon can spontaneously disappear and an electron will jump from that lower uh, electron orbit to that higher one whose energy difference happens to match the energy of the photon. Because of that, and because of the uniqueness of those orbits, which is based basically on the atomic number, we can identify all sorts of elements and compounds just by seeing what kind of light they emit. So that this is just another one of those things that we're doing. So that's kind of cool. All right. Uh, let me go back to the battery section now. So what I wanted to say regarding batteries is uh, we now have some idea of how to make one. And your book has that nice little picture of uh, basically Galvani's battery. What I will tell you is that we generally use a symbol like this. That's the simplest battery symbol that we use. But sometimes you'll see it written like this and maybe even like this. Uh, I do not know of any history that suggested that uh, one of these symbols, meaning when you had two dashes versus one or something like that, I, I've never seen any history where that number meant anything, but there actually might be something to it. There, there, it could have been that maybe they used, you know, three pairs when you're using a certain type of battery, and only two pairs when you're using this other type of battery and maybe only one pair. I don't know any of that history, though, so I can't tell you. I do have a, a books by Maxwell and Faraday and all these uh, Volta and all these people, but I haven't run across any of that. But in general, you can see now why the battery symbol looks like that. What I will tell you specifically is that when you're dealing with a battery the symbol does tell you some very specific information that's important. And that part is that the long side is the positive end of the battery and the short side is the negative end of the battery. And what that means is that's the high voltage is the positive side. And this side is the low voltage. OK, so that's kind of important. And if you actually look at the drawings, for instance. You can see that, for instance, this would be an aluminum plate. And what I said was you put a little gauze between it. But if you look at Galvani's drawing, he doesn't show anything between the iron and the, I mean, between the aluminum and the zinc. Uh, I did. And it would look like this. And then, of course, you could put another little bit right there and then another aluminum right there. Another little bit right there and another zinc right there and keep on stacking those up. Now you see that's actually what it looks like. So that gives you some idea uh, specifically of why, why they use that symbol. Now, if I attach the wire to this, that wire could be hooked to the V omega opening and this wire 
might be hooked to the comm opening or port. And then our, multi, our multimeter would read, let's say, 0 0.6 volts, something like that. Okay. Any questions on that? Now, we're fortunate. We've already learned some things because we had our labs and stuff already. So we already know Ohm's law. I'm going to go ahead and write this here. Uh, write Ohm's law here because we're going to make use of it. And Ohm's law says that the voltage V applied across an object of resistance R is proportional to the current I. Whoa, Nelly. It's proportional to the current I. And, of course, we know this is measured in volts. which we'll say is just V like that. We know this current is measured in amps, where one amp is equal to one Coulomb per second. And of course, we know this is measured in ohms. Okay, so ohms law is important. And we say things are ohmic if when we make a plot of voltage versus current, let's say like this. So let's put the current down here and let's put the voltage up here. If you actually do this and get a straight line like that, then the slope of that line is equal to the resistance R, and of course the intercept should be very, very close to zero, if not exactly zero. Uh, objects that behave this way are called ohmic. Devices. So that's some phrasing that we'll be using uh, and you'll see it in your homeworks and stuff like that. So I wanted to make sure you had that. Now, we've got, of course, a, a few equations already. We also have some equations that we learned from lab. I want to make sure you guys are up to speed on those. And they're just like the formulas that we use for capacitance, but they're the opposite. So I'm going to show that here. I'm going to say the resistance the equivalent resistance of resistors in series is equal to R1 plus R2 plus dot, dot, dot on up to R, however many you have. And then I'm going to say one over the equivalent resistance for resistors in parallel is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2 plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. So that hopefully is something you already are somewhat familiar with just from doing the labs that we've done. Uh, basically the Ohm's Law lab and the series and parallel circuits lab. Uh, I will just as a reminder, I will say that one over capacitance equivalent in series is equal to one over C1 plus one over C2 plus dot, dot, dot. And I'll say that C equivalent in parallel is equal to C1 plus C2 plus dot, dot, dot. So that's what I mean when I keep telling you it, they're, the formulas are very much the same. They're just reversed. So hopefully this will help you keep them in your memory and, and you can pull them up rather quickly. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, so uh, your book does show a diagram of a battery, and also that's, of course, the same thing as a uh, a device used to, say, gold plate or necklace or something like that. I will tell you, if you actually, and, and I'm not necessarily recommending you do this because I, I've been told by numerous people that it's actually dangerous, okay, but I was an idiot and always was an idiot uh, going through grade school. Uh, I didn't really 
even take school seriously until about uh, my senior year, maybe the summer before that to some extent. So I did a lot of stupid stuff like peeing in light sockets and uh, leaning against uh, uh, <laughs> charged fences and uh, sticking my tongue on nine volt batteries, which I still do to this day and all that good stuff. But I did take a D battery and tear it open one time. And what I found was it was like an aluminum casing that it was covered in. So the, the stuff that says Energizer or Duracell, that's just like an aluminum casing. And then inside of there uh, was basically paste. It was like a grayish kind of paste. And what I found was a shaft right through the middle that looked just like uh, just like pencil lead, except it was much darker. You know, pencil lead, they bake that with graphite, but they mix it with clay. Uh, and that's what makes it right and hold it together and makes it softness and all that good stuff. But if you just took the graphite, uh, the carbon part, that's exactly what it is. So uh, a lot of the batteries in general use a, a carbon uh electrode and it normally turns out to be the anode and then the the cathode uh or actually i should say it turns out to be the positive one i can never remember off the top of my head which one's anode and cathode I, and it makes it confusing because cathode ray tubes shot electrons but i can't remember if it was called a cathode ray because the rays left the cathode or because the rays went to the cathode so i'll just leave it at that for that Point. but anyways the, the cathode should be positive i always remember the key or the t and cat is positive okay cool good deal okay so yeah th that's the cathode then so yeah the carbon electrode in a typical zinc battery you have zinc and carbon the carbon would be the positive electrode so that's the cathode and then the zinc would be the electrode uh the negative electrode and then you dip them both in sulfuric acid. Now, what you'll find out is that carbon electrode will actually just touch uh, a piece of metal that's the top. So that little nipple you see on top of a AA battery or AAA battery, that, that little nipple, if you were to just pull that cap off the battery, what you'd see is black graphite shooting all the way down to the bottom. And then the paste... Uh, actually has the other rod in it and the sides of the uh, the sides of the container can actually be acting as the other electrode and that's why the uh, paste is inside of there and then the cup is the actual uh, uh, cat or excuse me electro or excuse me is the anode excuse me <laughs> that's, uh, there's lost the word so yeah the actual cup which might be made of zinc is the actual anode uh and you just touch the bottom anywhere and that's basically the terminal but in your book it does show in figure 25 3 basically a zinc rod and a carbon rod both of which are are submerged partially in sulfuric acid and and that certainly is the beginnings of a battery that's more or less what the car battery you deal with is uh, it does make a point also to point out how you would connect them. So when you actually make a circuit, it's important that you now be careful here. I'm getting ready to give you a, a, a metaphor or an analogy that's not exactly real, but memorizing it will not get you into any trouble and it'll keep you from uh, and being able to make sense of whether a circuit's going to work. So what you want to picture when you're thinking of a circuit is you want to imagine that a battery pumps out little positive charges out of the cathode. Okay, so imagine little charges are literally coming out of the battery, out of the positive end. That's going to shimmy through a wire, and then it's going to enter the object, the load, which might be a light bulb, for instance. Go through a wire in there, which has a filament in it and all that, and then come back out the other electrode of the of the uh, light bulb, then it's going to shimmy through another wire and come back in the negative end of the battery. So that little narrative where the positive particle, you actually picturing it inside of the battery, then leaving through the anode or the cathode of the battery, going through the wire and then entering the one of the terminals of a light bulb going through the the actual filament of the light bulb and then coming out the other terminal of the light bulb going through yet another wire and then coming in the back that's what you need to establish to make a circuit work 
Now, the part of that that I'm saying is not necessarily true is that we, we know that generally speaking, it's very rare that the actual uh, particles leave the actual battery or actually leave the actual wire or anything like that. It's more like they just get compelled to move in the direction the conventional current's going or more, more realistically is conventional current's not real. It's actually the opposite of it, but we there's only like one experiment we can do that shows whether it's positive particles carrying the current or negative particles. And it's called the Hall effect. And the Hall effect shows that it's actually negative particles. But as long as you're not uh, trying to measure the voltage difference from one end of the diameter of a wire to the other end of the diameter of a wire, then it's not going to matter. Okay. So we can still just picture conventional current pretends positive charges leave the battery. They don't necessarily do that. And then travel through the wire. Electrons actually do travel through the wire, but they go through the other way and they don't travel huge distances at any one instant. They go a little distance and collide with another or something like that. Uh, and then they also, the electrons or the positive particles don't leave the wire to go into the next thing or leave the next thing to go into the next wire or leave the wire to go back into the battery, but they have to be allowed a path so they could do that. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, your book has this conceptual example where it's trying to make sure you guys know how to connect, for instance, a light bulb to a battery. So, what I'm going to do is draw a little battery here. And of course, this is the positive end of the battery. This is the negative end of the battery. And this will be a light bulb right here. And if you've seen a light bulb before, you've, you've of course used the ones in our lab. And you know they have threads around it like this. And and so on. Okay. Well, here's the interesting point. Is if you look at the bottom. What you'll see is. This is usually. Shiny. Uh, and I realize I don't know how to spell shiny. <laughs> Usually reflective. <laughs> and is an insulator. Okay. And this part right here. Usually... a darker dull metal and it's usually lead so you can actually use it to solder with so you'll normally see a nipple on the bottom of the light bulb especially the small ones now incandescent bulbs like you use in a light socket at your house uh, they usually just have a piece of metal they're not actual uh, lead but in this case they do this part out here is brass, usually, and they're the brass threads. And in fact, you can treat this one as uh, plus or minus, and then the other one's the opposite. So this is the plus or minus node, our connector. And then, of course, this one would be the minus slash plus connector. Because what's going to happen is inside of there, you will see that this wire comes up and then goes back down and then is more or less soldered to the side. And then, of course, we'd have the glass and the bulb like this. So what I would do from this point is you can take the end of your wire 
and connect it this way so that it actually threads around if you want. That's in fact the way that they showed it in your textbook. Okay, so you can attach that to the outside threads and then you can attach this other wire to the bottom right here. And it would connect like that. So that's how you connect a battery to a light bulb. Notice how you can foresee, you can actually imagine positive particles exiting the battery through that little nipple on top, then going through the purple wire, then coming out of the purple wire, going into the brass fitting, uh, and that causes it to go into that purple uh, filament inside. And then it'll go around that filament and come out the little lead part. And then it'll go through the wire and come back to the negative part where it can re-enter. So that's essentially what we're picturing. And for that reason, we picture the current going this way. And this is called conventional current. Any questions on that? Okay, so you got to have a, a return path as well as an outgoing path for your positive particles. And it would help for you to know that in reality, it's actually little negative particles going this way. But again, nothing ever causes any problems with that. And when we get to chapter 27, we'll talk about the Hall effect, but that's really what causes it. Uh, you also know that batteries, for instance, double A, triple A, C, and D batteries have a nominal voltage on the order of 1.5 volts. Now, when you buy them, before you connect them, you'll probably find that they read like 1.72 volts or something like that. And that's because as soon as you actually connect this uh, battery, for instance, to a wire and then run that wire to a load, it's going to start drawing current out of it. And the battery has something that behaves as if it's got a resistor inside of it. And that resistor inside of it causes the voltage to drop from, let's say, the 1.72 volts that you see there. It'll actually make it drop to maybe 1.6, 1.58 or something like that when you've got current pulling from it. So that's why they actually create the battery uh, at around a 1.72 volts or something like that so that it still gets you what's required, the 1.5 volts for some period of time. Okay. So that's what AA, AAA, C, and D batteries are. And in fact, you'd be surprised uh, if you ever take the time. Again, this is something they tell you not to do. Uh, if you take any bigger batteries, like those compound six-volt batteries, are uh, ones that you see in some of the power drivers, or ones that you see in like those little uh, cars that little kids can drive around, those batteries are actually usually made of like C and D batteries that have just been bound together. So it's pretty remarkable that that's the case. Uh, there's also, of course, 9-volt batteries. Those are the rectangular ones. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, not, not that you do it with a random one you found in a parking lot or in a ditch or something, but uh, that's the number one checker for me when I check my 9-volt batteries. I stick it against my tongue. Uh, it burns. It hurts. It tastes funny. <laughs> but that is a, a, a neat little experience that I think everybody should experience. And it's relatively safe. Uh, so it doesn't feel good. It, it can, it can, you know, cause a little bit of pain, but anyways, I, I just think it's kind of nice to do that. So now we've covered sort of what batteries do and what circuits do in general. I, I want to tell you also that remember the equation potential energy U is equal to Q times V. Remember that was the, uh, equation that gave us the unit the electron volt 
because it literally looked like an electron volt. Well, if you want to calculate power, so power, the average power is work divided by time. In other words, if you take the total amount of work you did and divide it by the time taken, you'll get a certain number of joules per second. And, and of course, one joule per second is defined to be one watt. And remember, a joule is about as much uh, energy as it requires to lift a red, delicious apple, like a really nice succulent one you'd find at, you know, Harris Teeter. If you lift one of those up off the ground and lay it on a kitchen table, that took about one joule of energy. So when you talk about a watt, imagine doing that every second. If you talk about 100 watts, imagine lifting 100 red delicious apples every second and putting it on a dining room table. That would be uh, what a watt is. But that's power in general. In reality, without the actual uh, average, it can be dW over dt. And of course, we learned that potential energy is also uh, related to work. So we could also write du over dt which when I plug that in, D of, oops, D of QV over DT is equal to DQ over DT times just plain V, which is I times V. So that's another important equation we want to use. Notice I didn't have to do the product rule. What we've discovered is that IV is sufficient. In other words, in reality, since we said U is QV, if I really wanted to take the derivative of U, I needed to calculate DQ DT times V plus Q times DV DT. Well, it turns out when we do that, that doesn't actually add any other terms. So power is now an equation we have. Power is equal to I times V. Of course, if you don't know I, then you can use Ohm's law, which says V equals IR, like this. So I can eliminate that V by replacing it with an IR, and you get another important relationship for the power, I squared R. That is a really big deal. That I squared R is the reason that we send... Uh, power lines out in the country fields from one power plant to a neighborhood on those really tall towers. We put them on those really tall towers because the voltage has been stepped up to 200,000, 500,000, 700,000, or even a million, a million two volts. Okay. The reason why is if a power plant, for instance, is going to supply a neighborhood with electricity, and let's say the neighborhood has uh, 10,000 houses in it. Well, each house gets what's called a, or basically what is a 200 amp service. So you have to send out 200 amps times 10,000. Well, if you multiply 200 times 10,000, you get 2 million. Okay. So that's 2 million amps that would have to go out. And since P equals I squared R, that means the power, which is literally the, just the heat wasted by the resistance of the the wire that runs from the power plant to the neighborhood, that power is going to be given off as heat. And that's literally like 2 million times uh, basically uh, the wires they use uh, and going, say, 20, 30 miles might have two or three ohms of resistance, 10 ohms at most. But still, you're talking 20 million if it's 10 ohms. You're talking 20 million watts is being wasted when you're using uh, 2 million amps. So they normally step the voltage up and whatever factor you step the voltage up by, the current gets stepped down by the exact same amount. So if I step the voltage up from 120 to 1 1.2 million, then that would be like a factor of 10,000. Well, that would also reduce the uh, current from 2 million to about 10,000 amps or uh, about 20,000 amps, basically. Uh, and that would be a lot less. So that I squared R would be taken care of. So that's what that I squared R is about. 
Also, if you didn't know I and R, maybe you knew V and R, then you could also take the P equals IV and replace the I with uh, V over R, in which case you get V squared over R. Now, I just finished telling you how we use a step-up transformer to make the current low so we can not waste so much heat. Oop, transformer. Actually, I'll do it like this. Uh, I just finished telling you a story about how we step up the voltage uh, before we send power out over the country acres and stuff like that uh, just to co make the current lower. But it looks like V squared over R might contradict everything I said. What you got to remember is what that V is. V is what's the voltage difference between the power plant and the actual neighborhood or the substation outside the neighborhood. I is the current that goes through the wires and R is the total resistance from the power plant all the way to the neighborhood or the substation. So this V is not the 2 million volts that I just finished uh, stepping up the voltage to. The V would be, if I stepped it up to 2 million volts, it would hit the end of the line closest to the power plant at 200 or 2 million volts. When you got to the other end of the wire where the substation is or the neighborhood is, it might be down to 199,864 volts or something like that. That difference in voltage, that you know, 2 million minus 199,000 or 999,000, whatever, that little voltage is what matters, not the not the voltage that it's at, but the change in voltage. So uh, that's enough for right now. We've got, uh, in fact, it's time's up. I will tell you the only difference is when you start to talk about AC, uh, P equals IV works, but you randomly start getting one halves and stuff. So uh, we'll talk more about that next time and I'll start solving some problems for you. Do please type your first and last name in the chat. So I'll have you guys for roll and you're all free to go. Uh, I did change all the dates on the homeworks for chapters 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, uh, 30, 31, all the way up through 40. So make sure you check out those new dates. I don't suspect they're changing. And I've also given you quite a few uh, days extensions for, for some reason, 24 was due a long time ago, and that's not right. So hopefully that fixed your grade if you did it late. I'll wait till the last person leave in case anybody needs anything or has any questions. But other than that, you're free to go. I had a question. Yes. Um, I emailed you. I'm not sure if... Uh... I actually haven't checked my email today, so you might have emailed me back. But I emailed you about an extension on one of the tests last week. Yeah, I remember a, that. Did okay. I wasn't sure if I uh, formatted the email correctly. Did uh, did you end up approving that? I wasn't sure. Was it was it was test four, if I remember correctly, like the test that was supposed to be due when you got back. Is that correct, or was it the online? Yeah, it, -face? It, it, it was. It was on the face to face test. It was an online test, but I took the I took a prax test instead, and I thought it was a real one. There's so many yeah. tests, and it's hard to know which one's a prax one and which ones are actually graded. And I took the wrong one, and then when I tried taking the graded one, it was closed and won't let me take it. And I was like, tough. Yeah, so that grade, happens. Like, yeah, I'll open it up right now. Let me double check and see if you did it. Oh uh, yeah, that's the one you missed. So you did miss it. I'm gonna open it back up. Can uh, you think you can do it to by tomorrow? Yeah, I can do it by tomorrow. I'll do it. I can do it when I get back from lab. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open that back up for you right now. So, actually, I, I thought I'd done it, but I did not. I don't see your name here. Okay. I, I might have missed a, one earlier in the year, too, but I think I, I, for, I forgot to ask you about that one. But gotcha. I mean, I, I, I can do them whenever. I just I, I don't want to have a zero on them. It's not like I'm, I'm meant to miss them, but sometimes I forget to do practice tests, and then I'm not sure if those are even graded or if they're just actually for practice. But Yeah, I'm, they are for practice, but you get a lot of extra credit points by doing them. Okay, yeah, because I, I do, I definitely do some of them, and then some of them I, I like just do my own type of studying, and then when then when I see my grade and it's actually including on the grade, I'm not sure if it's something that gets dropped towards the end or what. So, gotcha. <clears throat> well, it's it's now ready, and you can go ahead and take it at your leisure. Let me know if you need anything. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't reply to your email, but I definitely remembered getting it from you. So yeah, you may you may have replied. I, I just been busy all day. I've been able to check my my student email. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say I have an excuse like that, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. I appreciate right. it. Have a good Thank one. You. you too. See you.
Hello. Hi, Professor. I tried to type my name into the chat, and it was it would not go through. So. Okay. Will it will it do it now? I did it like three times. So. Okay, I'm gonna type it in for you. Name. Yes, type it in, Darnisha Kelly. Thank you. No problem. You have a good one, Darnisha. You too. Okay, that's cool. Today's the 19th. That's set up right. That looks like it. No one else is here. So I guess I will end that.